Hello and welcome to the Mid-American Gardener Half Hour. We're happy to see you and we hope that you enjoy and learn a lot from listening to us uh, today. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. But there are two really talented folks right next to me and listen to what their expertise is so that you can gear your questions towards exactly what they are great at. So let's see who it is and inter have them introduce themselves. I'm gonna start first with Bill Vanderwhite. Hey there. Hi, how do you do? I'm uh, Bill Vanderwhite. I'm a certified arborist and my specialty is trees. And we're about a month away from planting season, from fall planting, and I always get questions about trees and different trees. And what I have here is a unique tree that I think is underutilized, and it's called ironwood. Uh, this is a native tree found in the eastern half of the United States. It tends to be an understory tree, uh, which means it grows under the canopy of larger trees. So it's not a real large tree, uh, but it might get up to about uh, 50 feet at maturity. Now, if you were to Google ironwood, you might not come up with this tree, and that's because there's a confusion of common names, uh, and quite often a different tree, Carpinus carolinia, which is also called ironwood or blue beech or musselwood. But there is a common name for this that would really lead you to this tree, and it's called hop hornbeam. If you look at the fruits here, they resemble that of the hops plant. And I stripped the leaves on this uh, ironwood or hop hornbeam so you can see them clearly. And I have with me here the common hops plant. This is the plant that we use in making and flavoring beer. Also can be used in, for teas and also for making uh, pillows for relaxation for people with insomnia. So this is a perennial vine. Well, technically it's a bine, B-I-N-E. Uh, but it, it grows uh, very quickly, it gets to 8, 10 feet overnight and produces these very uh, wonderful uh, female fruits, which we call hops. And uh, they're, uh, with the popularity of, of beer making and craft beer, uh, a lot of people are starting to grow these. But it's a great plant too. It can be used as an, an ornamental and trellising. So there you go. It's so interesting. So the hop horn beam is a little bit bigger, the, the actual hop it, it part is. of it. It is. But it does re really resemble. It's very, uh, it's, it's close. And I did, I did not mention hop hornbeam too is in the birch family. If you look at the leaf, it might see the resemblance. But wow. yes, the fruits are very similar. And they come on the plant around the same time, sometime in August. Well, I love the hop hornbeam or ironwood. It's right where we sit when we look out onto the river where we live. And it's great. You can, it's really ornamental. Yeah, it's a great tree. I have one in my house too. Really like it. But my, uh, my hops will grow about a foot a day, I've noticed. Yes, yes, they're that's, very, that very aggressive. A it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and, that's and a little don't bit. Don't sit still on your porch. Exactly. One word of caution, do not confuse. These, these are what are called common hops with Japanese hops. Japanese hops is an invasive. It is a annual, but it seeds and uh, it can be a big problem. Yeah, so be careful. All right, well, thank you. That was really informative. All right, now our next guest right next to me is Sandy Mason. Hi. Hi there. Uh, hi, I'm Sandy Mason. I'm with the UI Extension. I'm a horticulture educator for the Champaign, Fort Iroquois, and Vermilion counties. And my specialty being extension educator is are lots of things. Pretty much anything green and growing except mold in your refrigerator, is usually <laughs> what I say. So usually you can handle a lot of different things. And uh, we're, we seem to be talking tree night, and I think it's a great time to actually look at a lot of the native trees, and certainly that hop hornbeam is a great native tree, um, but also even bald cypress. So we may not really think about these being necessarily native around here, but certainly in Southern Illinois and certainly a lot of um, United States, they are native. And I, I think the one thing about bald cypress is we always think about them being really for wet areas. We always think of that, and they do very well in wet areas, but they also do very well in dry areas. So uh, you see them in parking lots, people can certainly use them even as trees in their in their landscape area. They're very pyramidal. They're, they tend to be a little wide at the bottom, but they're very pyramidal. So they're pretty tough trees overall. So don't necessarily, you know, 
uh, bypass them because you think they have to have really, really wet areas. And I just thought I'd point out uh, the whole thing about with bald cypress is that they are they're a conifer, but they have a very different looking cone to them. So this is perfectly normal. Sometimes people think these are galls or something like this. This will actually go ahead and dry and then kind of break apart and, and fall off. And, and it really is one of those things that I think makes it a great tree. And these are deciduous. So don't think just because it loses its leaves that it's a you know, dying or that would be like the that. hugest insect ever. That would be a be huge, yeah, 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 by far. But, but they're great trees. They, yeah, they're, they're super trees. And I think they really probably is another one that probably should be used more. Now, I know by the studio here, space. we have really upright ones. And then one died, and it's a shorter, wider one there, when they replaced There is a it. cultivar called Shawnee Brave that tends to be columnar. And we've and used it's, those. I, it's really yeah, a nice I street think, tree. Yeah. yeah. They're by a lot of the interstate bridges too. Yeah. Okay. And and they grow nice. very fast. They're tough trees. Yeah. They really they really trees. are. So I think it's a good tree. Good to yeah. Think about. Very good. Well, thank you. Well, hi, Randy. Hi. <laughs> I want to introduce our next panelist, and it's Randy Thorne. So glad to see you. Yeah. Made it. <laughs> Hello. And if you want to say a little bit about what your expertise uh, is before you go on. My name is Randy Thorne. I'm with the uh, Vermilion County Master Gardeners, University of Illinois Master Gardeners. Uh, and my background's mostly in landscaping, lawn care, so, uh, you know, lawn questions, hardscaping, uh, I, perennial shrubs, you know, just a little bit of everything, so. Yeah. Great. And, uh, did, would you like to? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, we got an email from uh, a gentleman that says, I have soaker hoses in all my garden beds for watering. However, I've been using a hand sprayer to fertilize, and he's wanting to know if he can fertilize through the soaker hoses. and. The problem with that would be most of the fertilizers, the chemical type fertilizers would be a, a kind of a salt type product. So at some point they are gonna clog up the hoses by evaporation. And if you're using an organic type fertilizer like an emulsion or a manure tea or something like that, you're probably gonna get some nasty things growing in those hoses. So my thinking is you're probably not gonna be able to fertilize very well through a soaker hose. Or if you did, you'd have to flush them pretty regular. So. And that might defeat the purpose. Yeah, that kind of defeats the purpose, yes. maybe. Yeah. Okay, well good, very good. Well now, next, we are going to go to a video email. Hello, join it. I've seen a lot of strange mushrooms in my life, but this one is the strangest. I put a pen on the ground so you could see the size of it. It looks like a pancake with a pancake on top. So just wondering what it is and where it came from. Thanks. A pretty good description of it. Yeah. All right, Bill uh, I'll, I'll is on it. I'll take it because uh, that's very common. We see that a lot. It's Ganoderma root rot. Um, you've had you had a tree that was there previously. I had a tree that was cut down probably about eight years ago, and periodically they still will appear. So as long as there is uh, there is decaying roots underground, that will still appear. And uh, now on live trees, quite often you can see these. Uh, particularly on honey locust, and uh, they will slowly, slowly result in the death of the tree, but they can be on there for well, 15 years before you know the tree might uh, expire. So uh, usually you don't worry too much when you see them. You gotta keep an eye on the tree, but uh, that is a root rot from a previous tree. And if she just wants to then remove it, kick it out of the way? Yeah, you can remove it. It'll probably come back and dry in dry times. You probably won't see it when it gets wet again. It'll come back. It's they're hard to get rid of permanently as long as there's decaying matter underneath. They're okay. always going to reappear. Yeah, they're just a fruiting body yeah. from the yeah. So but, if you uh, they're just breaking down the the root that's left naturally. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Thank you, viewer, for that. And if you have something to ID or a question, you too can send in a, a video to us, and here it is on the screen. So feel free to do that. All right, now, a viewer emailed us and gave us a little bit more information just because she was listening to a, the question about squirrels. And so if you want to uh, read, we just have a screen about what to do if you have squirrels. So got squirrels? <laughs> Here it is. Be sure to always check with local ordinances and um, officials. And then Sandy's gonna give us a little information too from our local extension. 
Yeah, I, I think one of the great things is you it, you can go to a website and it's called Living with Wildlife, and I think it's an excellent one. I use it all the time. Um, it's through U of I Extension, and then it was also through the Department of Natural Resources, and so it gives you all kinds of information. If you have problems with voles or rabbits or whatever, it lists the kinds of things you can do for management, but also even things like trapping, those kind of things. There's also a place to even, if you see some wildlife that you think shouldn't be here, you mm -hmm. know, a armadillo, something that shouldn't be here, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. um, then you have a way to actually report that to, to folks. Oh, that's uh, good you know, too. should this be here or whatever. So I think it's an excellent website. It's just called Living with Wildlife and it's excellent. And it may just identify it for you and you don't do anything. Uh, but uh, right, right. But it helps you even to sort of figure out because I know sometimes people will say I've got some I've got something right. uh, you know, chewing on my tomatoes or whatever. And so sometimes it really can also help you to sort of figure out what the problem really is. And then maybe relax. Yeah. Or, <laughs> maybe relax. or report it. We had a family of mink that oh, just wow. passed through. We saw them two days, a mom and two half the size of the mom babies. And oh, black minks, they just were underneath a stone area I had, and then two days they were oh, moving on. Because we wanted to look at them again. <laughs> so. Be glad you don't have chickens. Oh. We did. That's oh. why we watched them, but the chickens were <laughs> <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's time to go to the phone line, so let's go to uh, line two. It's about sweet potatoes. Hi there. Line two. Are you there? I hear nothing uh, from. Oh yes, what's your question? I, I was wanting to know when you pick uh, or dig sweet potatoes. Okay. Well, the the good. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear us? Hopefully you can hear us. Okay. Uh, uh, the one that usually I just wait until actually they get a little nipped. You don't want them to go through a heavy yeah, uh, freeze. Right, you just don't want them to go through a heavy freeze. So, so generally, you want to do it about the time it starts getting cool, because they're really once it cools off, they're not going to grow that much anyway. Mm -hmm. So, I usually just kind of wait around and sometimes it could, they get a little nip. It could be October. Yeah, it, as long as it's hot, they sweet potatoes love the hot weather. So, as long as it's fairly mm -hmm. hot, they do a good job of. And, and it's always so much fun to dig them up, and you can see how <laughs> big they are and how well they did. It's the one crop that does well when it's hot and dry. Mm -hmm. So that's the good news. And they were fairly good last year. Yeah, they were really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were good last year. It and should be, should be this okay year. this year, too. Great. Well, thank you for that question. And now we're going to go on to a question about a perennial, and it's Arkansas Blue Stars. Hello there. Line three. Hi, Diane. I love your show. Great. Thank you. I think I could take up a whole 30-minute question. Okay. We'll try not <laughs> to. <laughs> um, I have two Arkansas Blue Stars that yes. are three years old. Mm-hmm. And this year, one of them looks like it's dying from the top down. It just shrivels. Is and it darkening? It, it's just looking really, really bad. The whole thing completely or just sections? The whole plant is mm -hmm. probably about half the size of the other one. And the other one has just started this week shriveling up at the ends and dying down the stem. Hmm. And I'm wondering if it might be a fungus. I don't I know don't if they know get anything they're pretty that tough they get. Plants. They're they're pretty tough plants for the most part. So I don't know They're known for drought resistance. Yeah. I would say what well, I would say what, what's the watering? How much have you watered or not watered? Hmm. I water about an inch a week. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. And I said, I know, you know, with the extreme heat. Now, this is a three-year-old plant? Yes. Do you know how much I would water a three-year-old plant? Nothing. Uh, I would not have <laughs> watered it. I well, really wouldn't have I watered have it. I have dahlias around it. You know, oh, move those bed, dahlias next year. I have to water. You have to not plant dahlias near a drought-loving plant. Mm -hmm. Dahlias are a moist-loving plant. Do not have dahlias near Arkansas blue stars. They are known for drought resistance. They're tough. They're from the south, Arkansas. You know, you really need to move that around and just hope for the best this year. Trim those out, maybe. Just um, yeah, back off on the water for Back now. off on yeah. the watering. And I would not water Arkansas blue stars ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Let it have natural. Is that overstating yeah. it? No, no. They Never really again. Don't, That's the thing we don't like about Don't water them ever. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, don't. And just say kind of late season like that. Sometimes things don't yeah. look all that 
great, yeah. but they still, you know, next year they do fine. Yeah. So I certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't give up on it. No, right? you can trim it out if it's ugly for yeah, you. Yeah, a lot but of stuff came back strong after the drought last yeah, year. Yeah. So. It, it, it surely did. And Arkansas blue f stars have the most beautiful fall color. Yeah. It's an orangey, <laughs> really nice. So hopefully you get some. <laughs> well, thank you for that question, and hopefully it's just fine next year. All right, let's go to line four about ground cherries. Line four. Hi. Uh, yes. We were hosted uh, by someone who serves ground cherries, and we like them. And I would like to know more about them, whether they have nutrition value, uh, how do you grow them? Uh, what do you know about ground cherries? Wow. I know nothing about I ground no cherries. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have never they grown are. them. I'm not sure. No. I, uh, They're yellowish. Yeah. I think last week you would have had a great answer because our yeah, vegetable Chuck specialist. Yeah, Chuck Voigt would have been. That's one reason you listen for what yeah. the specialties are. Chuck yeah. Voigt would know this. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with no. them at all either, either. You might email us the question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the website, and then um, you know, then we can have someone when they're on talk about ground cherries. I know. I'm going to check it out when I get home. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's good too. But I saw that and I thought, oh, I hope someone knows it because yeah, I don't. Boy. We apologize, yeah, but it's not our specialty. And this is an area you do not want to recommend anything <laughs> because it's an edible plant. Yeah, right. So we apologize, but we'll have someone who does answer something about ground cherries in the near future. Or grow tomatillas next time. Yeah, which yeah. Are, which are yeah. good. And easy that to grow. tomatilla salsa is really yeah. good. Very tasty. All right, let's uh, be right back after a special Did You Know? Okay. We're going to do a round of emails uh, for our next time around, and I think I'll start with you, Bill, since I started with you before. Sure. So go ahead. I have a question about a mountain ash tree, and I guess I would preface it so the viewers aren't confused that a mountain ash is not an ash tree. Uh, it is in the rose family. It's associated with like uh, pears, cherries, apples, so it's, it's a whole different animal. The question is, I have a mountain ash tree that looks like it had some fire blight on it, I cut off some of the areas that were diseased and it has come back this year. Is there something I should spray on the tree to prevent this disease from killing the tree? I also have some blackberries near it and I would not like to damage them. Um, typically for controlling fire blight on a mountain ash tree, uh, and fire blight is caused by a bacterium, which is a little unusual. Most of our uh, diseases on trees are caused by fungal agents. And in this case, we use an antibiotic that you're probably familiar with. It's called streptomycin. It's used in, for humans and, and for uh, cattle and et cetera. But uh, there is a, a, a formulation called streptomycin sulfate sold under the trade names of agrostrep or agromycin, or simply if you just look, it could be called fire blight spray. You apply this when the tree is starting to flower and then you put it on every three to four days during flowering. When the tree is done flowering, you stop. Uh, so, but if you, if, and, and if you have difficulty finding fire blight spray, just go to an orchard uh, website and it's readily available. You should be able to get it from there. Hmm, that's a good mm -hmm. tip. Okay, thank you, Bill. And then on to you, Sandy. Okay, uh, we have, I, I thought this was really a great question. Um, they want, really wanted to know if anybody um, has a gardening calendar for Central Illinois that offers information as to when to prune, when to take action against specific insects or weeds, or um, planting fall crops, spray fruit trees. I, I think this was excellent because that we mm -hmm. deal with that a lot, mm -hmm. when, when, when to do what. Well, you can actually go to the U of I extension, actually does have a gardening calendar. 
Um, and so you can just uh, Google U of I extension, go to the garden calendar, and the nice thing is you can just go ahead and click on that for that day or whatever, and it lists all kinds of things, uh, things you can do, when to do, um, different things. Um, we do also have in our office, we actually have a garden calendar that, that we sell um, in our, our Champaign office and also in the Danville and Narga offices as well. So if you're, in, if you're near any of those, we actually have a paper copy, but I think the, the website is really a great a great resource for people. I think it um, jogs your memory. I think that's a lot of it because it, it's a mm -hmm. lot of it because how many times yeah. have we talked about like spraying for bagworms? Well, you got to spray at the right time. Um, it, you know, it doesn't do you any good this right. time of year when we're in the I had a friend know, said, oh, I dug my potatoes yesterday. I went, oh, my potatoes. <laughs> you know, because so, <laughs> they're, you know, they're all brown and wilted down and it, you, you go, it oh, just yeah. jogs your memory. So, yeah. so that's good. So that is a good question. Out. Very good. Well, thank you. And now, Randy, what do you have for us? I've got one someone sent in, says uh, they have purchased a uh, property that's got mature uh, pear, apple, looks like they said cherry pea, look like they've got the whole gamut here. Uh, they were wanting some reliable resources for uh, taking care of them organically, fruit trees and such organically. Uh, can you recommend some websites, et cetera, for pruning? I think the best recommendation I can make would be, uh, it doesn't say you know which state you're in or anything, would be your extension services, uh, give it Illinois, Indiana, whichever, and most of them in the Midwest are gonna be fairly comparable anyway as far as when and what to do. So I think I would stick with those resources for the most part, because they have, most of them have very good stuff on fruit trees, so. And then it's updated yearly and you always yep. mm -hmm. get the yep. most up to yep. date. Very good, well thank you. Well, this was uh, set here on the table and just wanted to show off our new Mid-American Gardener visor. It's a pledge gift from um, a couple weeks ago, but we'll be having it again. So if you're interested in getting a Mid-American uh, Gardener visor, you might tune in during um, some pledge drives or upcoming. This one I really want, but I have to give it back. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try not to hold on to that. That's really a nice one. Okay, let's go to the phone lines next. And we're gonna go to line five, and it's something about an oak tree. Line five. Hi there. Hi. I have about a 26-year-old oak tree that I didn't think anything could kill an oak tree. But I have a hole in the trunk down by the soil that looks like it's you know leaking sap or something. And if you stick something in that hole, it goes a long way. Um, are they known to be prone to insects? When, when you say, can you see insect activity in where the hole is, is that correct? No, I don't see any oh. insects at all. It's, it, it's where I feed my squirrels, and I may have caused it. And the, the, <laughs> yeah. the debris well, from all of the, the squirrel food kind of went up, up the tree, and I thought, oh, you sure. know, I, that shouldn't happen. So I dug it all away, and then I ended up with this kind of a wet spot and then found out there was a hole. And so I kind of stuck a stick in there, and um, I don't know whether it'll dry up on its own now that all that <clears throat> sure. leftover seed and stuff's not against it, or if. Well, it's not unusual to have a, a hole in a tree, and it's probably, uh, you know, er, every situation is different. But from the sound of it, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, if sometimes there can be a, a small wound that progresses into some decay, and it could even be like a, you know from hitting it with a mower repeatedly or even just once and uh, the wood will become decayed just in that one area the tree has a, a the way it grows it com compartmentalizes around that decay so it might spread a little and you might see some insect activity in the terms of like carpenter ant and typically they will uh, be opportunistic where the decayed areas but they don't really affect the rest of the the tree that is sound but I wouldn't be too concerned about it it's a great mechanism, that cart compartmentalization. Yeah. That saves yeah. a lot of trees, it seems. So there's your um, answer, and it might relieve her mind. Sure, It could be sure. just fine. Yeah, it's, it's not uncommon, that's for sure. Okay. Well, we've got another tree question coming up, so let's go to line six. Hello there. Hi. My name is Michelle. I live in Decatur, and I have a wild cherry tree that's at least 60 years old. Wow. When it got to be about four foot tall, it went into a Y, and one side of the Y, I know at the bottom where the Y is, and then three-fourths of the way up, there's hollow spots. 
on the other side, at the bottom, there's about a one-inch hole, and when I, it looked like brown sawdust coming out, and when I flushed it with water, there was a reddish, reddish brown bug that had like centipede legs and like a horn, uh, you know, like a C-shaped horn on the front of it. Is there any chance that this tree can be saved? Very difficult, really, from the description without, without seeing it. Again, um, uh, and, and quite often you might find insects where there is some decay. They're mm -hmm. just opportunistic. It's like they're not causing the problem. They're there right. because the problem exists already. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, it's just a little too hard to diagnose it just from that description without seeing it. And I would... I would think just the yeah. other part is just to sort of look at the overall health of the tree. You know, if mm -hmm. it seems like it's growing and, I mean, it's not uncommon, just as you were talking about, that some of these older trees are going to have holes. They have holes in them. We see that. Yeah, a 60-year-old tree. Yeah, that's yeah. a pretty amazing. old tree. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's on its way out or no, anything like that. So I think, I think people always need to sort of look my, at the overall tree. My only caveat would be that sometimes trees are very, can look very vigorous and very green, but sti still have structural problems. Right. That and that why is them a structural. Yeah. 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 And the one yeah. side being so, hollow, that's my real right. concern. Um, so it'd always be good to have somebody, a certified yeah. arborist, come out and take a look at it. Have a Don't certified arborist come out and take a look at it, um, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing. Very good. So uh, always go with that because this is a big tree. Wow, we had a fast show. I really <laughs> appreciate all of you and your answers and all of you viewers as well. Hope you have a great week gardening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.